Thank you for joining us for evening prayer at St. John's by the Sea on the internet. Feel free to pause here to compose your hearts for worshiping the Lord. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no help in us. But you, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to your promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given power and commandment to his ministers, to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all those who truly repent and genuinely believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beg him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first lesson is taken from the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning at the first verse. Now the whole earth had one language, and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and bitumen for mortar. When they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is taken from the second chapter of Acts, beginning at the first verse. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them, and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes, Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and the Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, 
Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Using the words of the Apostles' Creed, let us confess our faith together, saying, I believe, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening for evening prayer. Hopefully there is a number of us from the church who are gathering together on the web and joining together. I have not received very many prayer requests from those in the church and obviously with job situations it is kind of stressful. So I would encourage you please to let me know so I can let the body know how we can Pray with one another and lift one another up. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So the question we probably are asking ourselves today is what can I do when I'm trapped in my house to help share, spread the gospel and build up Christ's church? Or... Is the church on timeout? Well, obviously, I'm not going to tell you the church is on timeout. Um, it's the time to find other ways which we can minister and we can spread the word. So, revisiting this Wednesday and next Wednesday, I want to share with you a message that I gave when I was first candidating here concerning how God can and does work through us if we let him. Acts chapter 2 covers really the birth of the church, and it takes the mission of the church and kind of gives us a wonderful picture that we can apply to any event at any time. First, Acts chapter 2 is a spiritual new covenant fulfillment in the church of the old covenant feast of Pentecost, what Moses had given to the people in the Old Testament to celebrate the agricultural festival, how God raised up the grain for us. We have the opportunity to celebrate the great spiritual feast in Acts chapter 2, the harvesting of souls rather than wheat, beginning in Jerusalem. The second parallel with the Old Testament, and I'll share more about this next week, compares how God confused the people in the Tower of Babel, scattering them across the earth, and how the Holy Spirit's work in that first Pentecost was a work to reverse the curse and bringing man together by the Holy Spirit, which had been scattered by God. So again, this brings us to the question as we look to how we can minister. What does all this mean to me today? So to begin with, I'd like to share a tongue-in-cheek pastoral search committee report of a church and give their effort to find a new pastor. I've looked up many times trying to figure out how old this is, and I can't find any original for it, but it's a great illustration slash joke. The pastoral report says, we do not have a happy report to give. We have not been able to find a suitable candidate at all for our church. We do appreciate all the suggestions from church members, and we followed each one up with interviews or calling at least three references. The following is our confidential report 
on the present candidates. Noah, former pastorate of 120 years, but with no converts. And he seems to be prone to unrealistic building projects. Joseph, he's a big thinker, but he really turned out to be quite a braggart. He actually believes in dream interpreting and he has a prison record. Moses, a modest and meek man, but a very poor communicator. Sometimes he stutters at times. In fact, he's been known to blow his stack and act rashly. Some say he left an earlier position over a murder charge. David, the most promising leader of all until we discovered the affair he had with his neighbor's wife. Solomon, a great preacher, but our rectory couldn't possibly hold all the wives. Jonah says he refused God's call to ministry until he was forced to obey after getting swallowed up by a great fish. He told us the fish spat him out on the shore right down the road and told him he was supposed to come and preach to us. Naturally, we just hung up. Peter, too blue collar. He has a bad temper and he's even been known to curse. He had a big run-in with Paul in Antioch. Very aggressive, but he is a loose cannon. Paul, a powerful CEO type leader and a fascinating preacher. However, he is single, he is short on tact, unforgiving with the younger ministers, and he's been known to preach all night long. Timothy, too young. Methuselah, too old, way too old. John, he says he's a Baptist, but he definitely doesn't dress like one. He slept in the outdoors for months on end, has a weird diet, and most of his preaching seems to consist of insulting the rest of the church leadership. What these men have in common is that outwardly, they had many defects from the world's point of view. Looking at them, the skeletons in their closet, their worldly defects would be assumed to prevent them from being used to build God's church. But nothing can change a person so much as being filled with the Holy Spirit for the work of God. Jesus took his 12 disciples, not from Jerusalem, but from an area of Galilee, an area not noted at that time for producing people with great intellectual prowess, or religious leadership? Was this an accident? Couldn't he find in the theological schools in Jerusalem, or maybe the schools of philosophy in Athens, disciples who could carry on and systematize his theology much better than a bunch of fishermen from a backwoods province? Or is there a purpose even in the type of people Jesus selected to begin his church. As we look down through history, we see this pattern repeated time and time again. God constantly, intentionally uses what the world considers to be weak and unesteemed in order to bring down the strong and powerful. God used David, the eighth, the youngest of all of Jesse's sons, to slay Goliath and later to lead his people. God used Gideon and a small band of warriors to rout a much greater army of soldiers. And God does this to show us it is he and not us who does the work. And God does this especially in Gideon's life in that he had such a nice group of guys, a regular army. And so God says, no, that's way too much you'll end up thinking that you accomplished it rather than that I accomplished it. So tonight we take a look back at the beginnings of the church on the day of Pentecost. We look to a day where the church is consecrated by the Holy Spirit to be a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation unto God. On the Feast of Pentecost, as we see in Acts chapter 2, Jews from all over the world who spoke all sorts of different languages would travel to the temple in Jerusalem. 
we see the list of those very fun to pronounce places given in verses 9 through 11, Phrygia and Pamphylia and all the other names that Nick had to struggle through. And on this day, God, the Holy Spirit, unites his people so that whatever nation they come from, they heard the apostles speaking in their own tongue the wonderful works of God. After Christ's ascension, 40 days after Easter, the disciples followed Christ's direction to stay in Jerusalem. We find in chapter 1 that they continued, very interestingly, in one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and about 120 of his disciples. That actually should quite stand out because the fact that they could meet together with one accord is startling considering how often they quarreled with each other over which one of them is the greatest. These are the same people who wanted Jesus to forbid others from teaching or performing miracles in Jesus' name because they wanted to be the only ones who did it. It's kind of like the case with Gideon and David. The Lord uses his people beyond what the world thinks they're capable of, even beyond what they could do of their own strength and power, because he wants to show that it is his hand overall and his hand controlling what is going on. It is God and not the apostles, who enabled the spread of the gospel in the face of conflicts and persecutions. It is the Holy Spirit who enabled a group of Galilean fishermen to take Jesus' teaching, to remind them, and to help them to spread it after he ascended into heaven. It's a beautiful picture of what the world considers worthless, and God gives worth to it. Whereas 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 to 31 say, Think about the circumstances of your call, brothers and sisters. Not many were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were born to a privileged position. But God chose what the world thinks is foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world thinks is weak to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what he regarded as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So let's take some time to think of how this applies to me, especially how this applies to me trapped in my home. Are there things I could really do to help encourage the spread of the gospel? Are there things I can do to help build up the body of Christ? And we immediately think of all the things that we can't do. And throughout my life, I've been very privileged to work with youth ministries, such as our Reformed Episcopal Summer Camping Program as a youth pastor in churches, trying to involve teenagers into ministering to younger kids. And there's been a lot of times when young people would come to me and just be frustrated because they don't think they have the ability to do the things for God that they wish they could do. They're not smart enough. They don't have the personality for it. And not really to sound harsh, but it could very well be that they are right. However, it is the Holy Spirit who enables us to share and teach to do the things which we don't have the ability to do without his gifts. We th see throughout the book of Acts the change that has overcome these apostles. Peter is a fisherman. Here preaches in Acts chapter 2 a sermon 
that caused 3,000 people to repent and be baptized. In the next chapter, he astonishes those in the temple when through Christ, he heals the lame man by the beautiful gate. He preaches of Christ's salvation and 2,000 more are saved. And in Acts chapter four, he stuns the Sanhedrin with his eloquence of speech and knowledge of the scriptures when he speaks before them. This is the same hot-headed Peter who, before being indwelt by the Holy Spirit, couldn't seem to say or do anything right. And pay close attention to this, because this is a great passage for us to meditate on. After interviewing Peter and John, the scriptures say, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They realized that they had been with Jesus and that's really the bottom line of what we celebrate at Pentecost. Thanks be to God that through the Holy Spirit, the world can hear us speak and watch us live and know that we have been with Jesus. While we may be sinners by our nature, we might have all that baggage of the men in the pastoral search committee report. While we may be faulty and sinful, hot-headed and flawed, the Holy Spirit who indwells us and enables us to partake of a new nature without sin and death. While we of our own power may be complete bumblers and incapable of offering anything to God of any value, if we, by living in the life of the Spirit and by walking in the way which Christ brings before us, reach out, we are able, like Peter and the others, by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the mighty works of God for the salvation of the world. And so that those who see the Holy Spirit in us will know that we have been with Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming into our lives and making us capable of doing things of our own strength we are not able to do. Help us, Lord, in whatever circumstances we are in, to seek to show the world that we have been with Jesus. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It is now time to lift our prayers before the Lord. I'll draw your attention especially to the words of our collect of the day in a time of great mortality like the one we're living in now. We, many will look to why we are under such a situation. And this prayer says that despite our evil deeds, which truly deserve to be punished, that we can call on God's grace and mercy. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Grant, we beg you, Almighty God, that we who for our evil deeds do worthily deserve to be punished by the comfort of your grace may mercifully be relieved through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, who hates nothing that you have made and does forgive the sins of all those who are penitent, create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain of you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O most mighty and merciful God, to whom alone belongs the issues of life and death, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto you for relief. Deliver us, we beg you, from our peril. Give strength and skill to your ministers of healing. Bless the means of cure, and grant that, perceiving how frail is our earthly life, 
we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom which leads to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, light in our darkness, we beg you, O Lord, and by your great mercy defend us against all perils and dangers of this night for the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, the high and mighty ruler of the universe, who does from your throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beg you with your favor to behold and bless your servant, Donald Trump, our president, our Senate and representatives in Congress assembled, Philip Murphy, the governor of our state, and all others in authority, and so replenish them with the grace of your Holy Spirit that they may always incline to your will and walk in your way. Empower them plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant them in health and prosperity long to live. And finally, after this life, to attain everlasting joy and happiness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Almighty and eternal God, from whom comes every good and perfect gift, send down your Holy Spirit and grace on our bishops especially Foley, Ray, and Chuck, and other clergy. And we pray especially now for our prayer cycle, for Paul Luth and St. George's Church, Howard Curie and St. Luke's Church, Kevin O'Brien, Jamie Anderson, and Ocean City Baptist Church, John Sheldon and First Presbyterian Church, and the congregations which they all serve. We lift up also the Ministry of Hope Pregnancy Center and Atlantic Christian School. Hear our prayer, and that they may truly please you, pour upon them the refreshment of your blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honor of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, the strong tower and refuge of your people, we entreat your favor upon the officers and all who have been enlisted in the service of defense of our country. Ever spare them from being ordered into a war of aggression or oppression. Use them, if need be, as your instruments in the defense of our national life and liberty. But restrain, we beg you, the greed and wrath of man, that wars may cease in all the earth. Watch over also all policemen and law enforcement officers everywhere. Protect them from harm in the performance of their duty. We pray also for firefighters, first responders, and health care workers who protect us and ours from all types of danger. Give these men and women the courage and skills to carry out their duties well and safely. When they must go into the face of danger, be by their side. Watch over their families, reminding them that those who go into danger are in your loving care. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. O God, the creator and preserver of all mankind, we humbly beg you for all sorts and conditions of men that you would be pleased to make your ways known unto them, your saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for your Holy Church Universal that it may be so guided and governed by your good spirit that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to your fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body, or estate, especially those for whom our prayers are desired. We lift up to you, Lord, St. John's Church and all of your churches, Lord, who are looking to find creative, positive ways where we can continue our ministry to a world which is sick and dying. Guide us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit. Help us to continue to be effective for your gospel. We pray, Lord, for Joe Gangloff, Michelle's brother, who has been diagnosed with cancer and is currently in hospice. We pray for Lynn Blitz, and I thank you, Lord, that she was recovered enough to leave the hospital and to enter a rehab center yesterday. Continue to watch over her. 
We pray for our family and friends who have businesses which have been so greatly affected by the virus. We pray especially for Heather and Al, for Larry and for Mark. We lift up to you, Lord Rachel Rosenberg, Dominic, Sydney, Heather and Grace, Ariel and Oliver, Maricel, and we thank you, Lord, for her safe travel home, for Dolores, Rebecca, Jonah, Doreen. We lift up Noah and his continued problems with teething and his ear infection. We pray, Lord, for Jonathan, his stress and his jaw. We pray for Brian McManus and all of our students who are not able to go to school, that they can be effective in their studies from home. We pray, of course, Lord, for all those whose lives have been so greatly affected by the coronavirus. And here are silent prayers of our hearts at this time. We pray, Lord, that it may please you to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of all your mercies that our hearts may be truly thankful and that we may declare your praise not only with our lips, but in our lives by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have promised to hear the petitions of those who ask in your Son's name. Mercifully accept us, who have now made our prayers and petitions to you, and grant us those things which we have asked in faith according to your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.